Welcome to Dying of Exposure. Uh, this is as uh, Greg. Greg, what series is this? This is hard for Picard. Hard for Picard, aka in the title, rant and watch engages with Star Trek Picard. Hard my, for Picard. My name is Steve. I'm Greg. And uh, today we are watching episode three of Star Trek Picard, uh, the beginning of the end. Beginning of the end. No. No, the, the end, end is, is the beginning. End is the beginning. End is the beginning. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, we had two very different episodes between episode one and episode two. One was super kind of, kind of like moved a lot of things happened. Yes. There was quick deaths of characters you didn't really care about. Uh, things like that. Um, we have, uh, a new, um, uh, episode two, great beginning, like big, exciting beginning. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then lots of talking and we discussed so that much so talking. much talking necessary talking we kind of needed to know where the hell we were in this plot but maybe a little too much for one episode six minutes of action and then a giant exposition episode. exposition um i mean it did have the great i believe that's the episode with the great like uh um uh picard standing up against that admiral yes that was fantastic um and so that that's worth it um but uh now we're into episode three. Um, we know that we ended up the last episode with him uh, uh, meeting with an old shipmate, and Raffi. So, Raffi. So let's let's get into it. All right. There has to be something, some last desperate wild solution, JL. That's what you do. My resignation was the last desperate wild solution. Oh, so much to unpack. Yeah, um, lots, lots there. Uh, so uh, that conversation between Rafi and Jean Luc, with them no longer, I guess, being part of Starfleet, is Starfleet calling his bluff on "I will resign if you don't do this." You know, there is there's so much um, uh, that there are so many callbacks to brilliant moments in Next Gen where. He was always the maverick, always on the outside, and that was kind of not a go-to move for him, but he was really fond of giving uh, Starfleet the middle finger in a very yeah. a morally superior way. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people are like, like they, again, a lot of people tend to, uh, tend to conflate Starfleet with Picard in the Enterprise, and those have historically not been the same thing. No. Uh, and lots of times he comes up with ways not necessarily to break the Prime Directive but to utilize it in a way or a way that the Prime Directive allows for uh, behaviors to help a people so he's not as cavalier as Quirk where he's like fuck rules let's do it but he's very like if, if Starfleet's pulling back or they're trying to be politic or they're trying to hide under the Prime Directive um He's like, yeah, but like this, right? Like, we can just do this. I'm I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to pull it off, and then you're going to be fine with it. I will go on record as saying there is at least a dozen episodes in Next Gen that the core plot involves Jean-Luc giving Starfleet the middle finger. Yeah. Oh, just e easily. Completely. There's multiple episodes each season, honestly. And, uh, and so... It is sort of a, a not surprising that they might not want to. I mean, Jean Luc is not a captain that um, Jean Luc is not a captain that that compromises easy on what they think is right. And so, uh, if they have a moral imperative to do something, they're going to push for it constantly. And for any military and or political body, that's a nightmare. <laughs> in a especially in an icon where they're like people love this per every very famous like very well known is very front facing Klingons yes you know uh uh uh, uh d help resolve Borg issues y you know like these kinds of things but we can't control him in any way. I, I was thinking about it a lot after last week's episode mm -hmm. uh, the, we, we already called back to it once that beautiful moment where he stands up and is giving the Admiral mm. the business um, he is wonderfully arrogant mm -hmm. uh, and I wonderfully meaning uh, broadly and incredibly not necessarily that I love that 
character trait about him where Kirk was cocky. Uh, Jean-Luc is just arrogant. And yeah. I'm, there's that, that great scene, one of my favorites in Star Trek, where uh, he tells Q to piss off because human morality is better than anything he's seen uh, from, from the Q continuum. It's He is 100% convinced he's right. Yeah, oh yeah. And this whole breakdown of how the last 15 years have gone and what brings him to his unemployed and deeply bitter state uh i i think was just really well done and of course the acting was top notch top notch um uh different uniform look uh it's weird that uniforms like jumped to that and then kind of jumped backwards a little bit because when he's walking around starfleet most people are in kind of like a high collar take on voyager um and uh and and, and with a little ds9 thrown in for good measure and and they they go back to this almost like 70s kind of diamond yeah. pattern thing so i'm not going to pretend like i'm enough of an encyclopedia to know this it's what i've read online uh, but apparently there is a lot of attention being given to making sure that if if in next gen or ds9 or whatever they said at that like there's one thing that i saw it specifically called back to is that um is it bashir the 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 doctor in ds9 yeah um there's an episode where he's i, I think it's a i don't i don't remember if it's a time traveler or fake out or something but he's um 40 years in the future of ds9 and the uniform he's wearing in that looks like the uniforms they're wearing uh, in starfleet now so there's there's apparently an amazing yeah. attention to detail going on there yeah yeah and so they're really trying to get the nuts and the bolts right where they can where they don't have to just straight rewrite it because they're like that's not going to play. Yeah, does, yeah. Um, uh, really trying to get the nuts and the bolts right on the details. Um, but yeah, Starfleet calls him. We get to see episode three. We have now we 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 came in on episode one. Everything was screwed up. Right. Episode two is like, all right, here's the Mars attack. Episode three is like, all right, here's him being like, I want to do this or I have to resign. And they're like, okay, okay, resign. So, like, they're just hitting that those home runs with those, like, we give you a mystery in an episode or we give you a question, and in the subsequent episode, we answer a lot of those. There's going to be season questions, but for the most part, they're just answering questions. Here, here's the question that I need answered right this minute, though. We don't know what the Rafi picard relationship is yet. Um, we, we don't, uh, obviously, they have a professional, but... I need to know why she can get away with calling him JL. It's terrible. It's weird. Terrible. I know. Uh, it doesn't roll off the tongue either. It doesn't roll off the tongue. He's doesn't not the kind like of guy. Does feel like something Picard would be? No. Like John Luke would have um, applied a level of intimacy on that degree that Beverly Crusher had, and that would have been fine, I think, if they had backed that up with a history of a relationship where it's like, all right, this person is more family than crew. Um, but... Uh, JL is so casual. I assumed after last episode we'd find out that they that these two characters were lovers. Now we know she's a, she was a subordinate. Mm. Uh, I don't I don't see it. I, I can't imagine Riker calling him JL. Well, just, Riker wouldn't. I, I just saying. I call him I call him Space Daddy in the YouTube description. That is entirely reasonable. and everyone can call him Space Daddy. I think I think Patrick Stewart legitimately would love to be called Space Daddy. <laughs> right? Um, um, Jean Luc Picard probably not, but Patrick Stewart definitely. Yeah. No, no, what do you think? What do you think? Frame picture of Will Wheaton. <laughs> <laughs> I neglected you, and I wasn't there when you needed me. I am truly sorry. I don't care. All right, we're right in the middle. Of a scene, but we have drugs in Star Trek. We have we have what is uh, drugs and alcohol being used in excess, and an implication that she was an addict uh, to one or both. Yep. Back when she was in service, this is all new territory. So, um, an interview with this actress. comes up on the after show and i recommend watching it oh all right yeah um uh not not for this but 
I so so last week we had f bombs. Now we've got like now we've we, got. Are we pushing the modernization of Star Trek too much? I don't think so. Okay. I think I think I'm getting more and more bitter as I continue to read more and more Facebook Star Trek fan groups. Um, most I, most of you are terrible. Uh yeah. Um, I think that Star Trek was a world. Original series was a world where you could imagine alcoholics and drug users and they talked about alcohol like they talked about it right Right. like like um they definitely played on scotty's stereotype um a little bit to talk about over drinking at least right it's only next gen and honestly ds9 um, and even DS9 deals with it on a broader issue, but um, it with not humans, but uh, um, it's really it's really only next gen that paints a perfect picture of an unaddictive populace. I am... and I whereas I don't expect them to be like eighty percent of the world is stuck on this le- on this snake leaf. Uh, it, statistically people are going to do drugs they've always done drugs they always will no matter always, how well always, no matter always. where they are economically yeah. when, no matter where they are socially drug usage happens everywhere all the time so there's no reason that just because it's a utopia people don't want to get screwed up and then that means some people are going to go too far so I'm intrigued by something we don't get a lot in um, fiction in general but sci-fi in particular uh, is we have here a, a society that's advanced enough that they can purge addiction. Yeah, they can they purge, could genetically purge. Yeah. Right, you could you could have uh, your your um, tricorder sober you in a moment. And again, what's interesting to me is that Rafi is is identifying the fact that she is suffering from paranoia due to the effects of whatever snake leaf is. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's the, we're we're hitting some interesting depths. Uh, I I think I think what it brings is it brings the question of yes you can purge the genetic addictions to things, but you can't purge so simply flip a switch for psychological dependencies on mind altering substances no. like liquor like like weed. Um, so in that you um you are pretty much stuck um having to deal with that for the rest of society but it's very interesting this is also a super dark conversation this is the first time in a long time we've seen john luke painted as imperfect oh yeah 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 this is uh these these episodes are not not putting him in the best light for sure and it's it's interesting to see an elderly patrick stewart be able to bring regret to oh, the yeah. character in the way oh, it yeah. is right now. I really don't know what to say, Dr. Rasha. Your work here has always been excellent, but speaking to a nameless in his own language. Outstanding. We've talked about them hitting those details. Hugh. It brought us back Hugh. Hugh. Hugh is such a good... I mean, you got Borg, you got bring Borg back to reality. Such a such a good choice and i love i love the makeup they did on him make up the eye the, the yeah, weird like the offset scarring. eye that matches his scarring from his his original um uh assimilation um yeah it's fantastic and it opens up a lot of things you obviously had direct experience with lore um and uh dealing with that problem so um uh like that could retie around into the data and the new new soon connection. Oh, there's yeah, there are, there are so many layers to the Borg uh new new soon. There just just deep layers of uh Romulan paranoia. Romulan are even now that they're effectively neutered, still very very bad. Yep. And definitely uh, bad. And Don't cosplay the, him. No, that makes you bad. No, yeah, you cosplay you're bad, Romulans. You're bad, bad inside, and uh, only and bad people would want to do that. I mean, the, the first first thing I thought when I saw Hugh was Hugh, and then the second thing I thought is why the hell is he involved 
in a Romulan reclamation of a Borg cube that he goes on record as saying uh, he knows it's an exploit. He knows the Romulans yeah. are. So I'm I, I, I'm but excited he's to got, learn why. Like you gotta you gotta you gotta just believe, or at least my instinct is to believe that it's just empathy, right? It's Hugh has always been like this font of wanting people to be able to pick their own path. Right. And uh, uh, so I am guessing, I, I mean, he proved it in, I can't remember the name of the two episodes, but he proved it in the episode uh, where he returns on. Yes. Uh, is that he is not above kind of some shady ends to justify the means of his no. mission, which is unraveling the Borg's programming and mapping on people so uh it to me it's a it's it's funny because it's such a like a layup of a thing but the reason it's a layup of a thing is because there's like seven layers of where it's like oh we're gonna have the card we're gonna have borg we're gonna be talking about simulants well then we gotta be talking about um we gotta be talking about Hugh then yeah because he'd be in it yeah if it'd he be was tragic if he wasn't in the show yeah. in some way Director of Starfleet Security. I'd like to talk to you about your two recent visits with Admiral Picard. So after seeing, um, oh, what's her name from the Daystrom Institute? Do you remember her character's name? No. After seeing the doctor approached by, uh, by the security officer, the double agent, <laughs> the person that we as the audience know is the double agent, um, uh, we, um, we also get to finally move the needle on something that lots of Picard fans have been asking for, which is they're frustrated that it is not in space yet. Yeah, true. Because, you know, it's Star Trek. It's not Ground Trek. It's not French Chateau Trek. It's not French Chateau Trek. Um, yeah. Uh, um, but, uh, but, yeah, I think it's moving along. Okay, so... Rafi says she has absolute proof yeah. that the Romulans were in, are operating, that the Federation was involved, yeah. that the Mars attack was deliberate and covered up. Um, and now we know, and let's just assume that the character is being accurate, uh, now we know that the Romulans are going to real extremes to continue operating on Earth. Um, what the hell? How deep is the Romulan infiltration of the Federation to make this Daystrom angle so, seem... So, think of it this way, though. Um, so, an aspect of the Romulan Empire being the the or, older order of the Tal Shiar right. that hates AIs and hunts them down right. um, is hell-bent on doing whatever they need right as we know the federation has never been in starfleet itself has never been a unified single-minded organization right it's always had there's been you know handful of arcs on next gen ds9 voyager of of aspects within it um or enterprise disagreeing with how the kind of altruistic version of starfleet works and wanting it to move in more sensible if paranoid and more villainous on a kind of broader moral spectrum method is and so you know i really feel like this is a lot of left hand doing something the right hand is unaware of on lots of sides i i don't think that i if you were to tell me does the romulan star empire think that it's going to sacrifice you know, almost a billion people to get a point across. I'd be like, nah, that doesn't sound like Romulus. They would, they would sacrifice right. a ship, or like uh, uh, maybe a colony, but not a whole, not a whole people. That sounds like that's a lo that's a low ROI, and they're usually smarter than that. And it's the same thing with Starfleet. It's like would Starfleet kill a bunch of their own people? Not normally, but an aspect would. Here's here's my it's the slugs. Yes. The, the, the thing that's going through my head is um, it takes, uh, it, you know, let, let's talk about the military logistics here. It takes 40 years to, to put a, a sleeper agent into Starfleet oh, yeah. the way they have. 
you've got layer after layer of them mm. now operating on earth getting to earth all of these things in play and they are willing to risk it to jeopardize exposure on these twins and now track literally tracking john luke in person yeah there's that that is some that is some high risk behavior and i'm very curious as to why yeah no thanks what you want to do is take the giant hunk of tritanium shrapnel out of the hole in my shoulder that's just a guess please sit two short scenes that didn't really do anything right like it's like you're gonna interview one of the romulan people that you wanted to interview and uh that cares about ancient lore and uh religion and then then a quick sort of like a nice little reveal like you said uh, uh um while we were watching it um funny one of your favorite lines where he, he just comes into rafi who's already clearly researching the thing it's oh, like yeah. you're researching it already aren't you no i've sent you everything i have on on, on maddox Bruce i don't maddox. want it i don't want it okay, continue yeah carry on <laughs> carry and on the and it just it's, it, it so goes back good. to and, and we're gonna hit on this in the more significant portion um it goes back to that 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 picard arrogance and i think you nailed it on the head because it really comes across when he isn't carrying a rank and title yes um is when he's the captain and you're supposed to listen to him when he's the captain and you're supposed to hear him pontificate a bit to gain a greater understanding of you know his experience and his perspective because you work for him this all goes in line but when he's just some old guy uh that that used to be and still is a very important icon but like he used to have rank and he means nothing to you that that changes it it changes it a lot yeah i i i see the the, this character is so much more than his just being an admiral you know this is the guy who oversaw the cleon succession right um yeah this is a dude who is just used to being uh the most important man of the room most of the time yeah and uh i i love that swagger starting to come back in. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen angry. We've seen sad. Now we're getting a little bit of the swagger. A little bit of the swagger it. back. Now that he's got a bit of purpose behind him. Um, so Rios and the new ship, the ship that is inevitably going to take him where he wants to go because there's no reason they would have rendered it. <laughs> it's just if... the, a red hanger. Oh, it's a ship. No, that's not. That's gonna work not out. the ship. It's, yeah, no. it's just going to be a runabout the whole time. So every um, every D and D campaign when they come up to offer you the question and you just go, no, nah. no. Nah. Um, so uh, Rios though. Uh, so first when the EMH, what we find to be is the EMH with British accent version right. of that actor comes up. Which, having your own image, is your own medical professional. So good. What does that say about you so much? <laughs> like, so just, much. I'm it's the so only good. person I trust. I'm the only person. Ah, uh, it's, it, it's a nice touch. Yeah, it is. And, um, but that EMH um, comes in all Britishy and everything, and just with the way he was dressed and acting. Just like, and here's the clear Picard Doctor Who crossover that yeah. we've all been waiting for. Yeah, right. Um... But uh, 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 then bring it up to Rios. Rios is smoking a cigar. So something I realize, I think, and, and and I know a lot of the internet isn't seeing this because they start posting like the moment this goes live about their confusion or the things that they don't pick up. And so something that you should be aware of. So that kind of looks like a cargo freighter from the inside. Um, uh, on the outside, it's a little bit more sleddy, but uh, like like lengthy. Then I would, I, I, in my mind, a cargo freighter is just a big box, but because it's space and it doesn't need to care about, you know, friction. But, um, but it kind of looks like it carries some sort of cargo or something, but it has an EMH more specifically. And an EMH right. requires a hologram projection unit, right. um, unless he's got one of the portable ones like the doctor had no, in Voyager, I, but I don't, I don't think, think so. so. And the reason I don't think so is because it was able to be in Picard wherever. Kind of just yeah, on he, the he, ship. He transports Picard up. Yeah, uh, up. And he's able to replicate a med kit and booze on demand. 
We just right there at his desk, yep. not through a replicator. Right. So my guess is is that in this eighteen year jump, they figured out once they were able to make light physically appear in a reality outside of a hollow deck, right? That that isn't that much of a jump to their existing replicator and transporter technologies of uh, the ability to have like area rooms basically where they could sequence what they needed. And understand the layout of the room and put it where he wanted. It's honestly, honestly, it's not that big of a jump. It seems like this drastic change, but it's really just a sort of logical step. And it's not saying that they can beam anywhere all the time. It's that if they know where they're going and the area is able to receive a beam in. Well, yeah. The Why not? The two things that struck me about, uh, in addition to what you said, the two things that struck me about the ship uh one is that it's cavernous yeah that's what what led me to believe maybe cargo yeah but i mean everything is big and while trek has never um tried to be honest about the amount of space that it that the inside of a ship would have yeah uh that was huge this is big uh and then the second thing is it looks like the normandy for mass effect and i want one yeah i I want a a model on Uh, my desk that i i I love the ship already and we've barely seen it yeah um it looks good it doesn't look like any alien ship i've seen before so i'm kind of no. curious where it comes it from it certainly doesn't look like a, a federation it's ship. not it does not look like federation but it doesn't look like klingon romulan cardassian vulcan i hadn't thought about alien origin Ferengi, um you, you and orion um i'm just going through the list of ships in my head um yeah uh Kizinti. Always uh, the Kazinti. It's always the Kazinti. It's always going to be the Kazinti from here to forward. And so, yeah, it's not... Um, it, so, maybe it's from another species and we're going to find I think, it out. I think it has to be. Maybe it's, maybe it's just non-Starfleet. So, we get to see what happens when somebody makes custom ships as a Earther or as, like, a human. Like, because there's got to be... Like, yes, it, building a ship is a... Building a big enterprise or galaxy class is a stupid amount of money building a small ship would also be a stupid amount of money but you got to believe that in that world they exist private yeah, ships I, exist I, I'm, we I'm know that of, they exist All i'm right. kind of hoping that we're gonna get our glimpse of a first non-human scale race in star trek yeah maybe like a uh, bigger bigger uh race uh, so let's see has there been any non yeah, yeah, there haven't really been any... I mean, they're bigger and they're smaller, right? Yeah, but, but not something so massive. Right. Like Sluggy or something like something that. Something where he gutted the control suite and the chairs and put in new stuff. Yeah, And right. that's why, because it's used to having much 12, 15-foot tall... I don't know. Just large, lumpy snail boys or yeah. something like that. Sna- snail boys? That's, that sounds... I, I In my mind, in my mind... Hard for Picard... And the snail boys. And the snail boys. Uh, in my mind, uh, if you're going to go non-human, you go slug for some reason. I don't know where, why that's where I'm my a, mind jumps. I'm a diver. I'm all about sea slugs. They're yeah, yeah. Like I feel awesome. like it's slugs and octopi. Those are the things. Yes. The, 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 the octopi are octopi. already damn near there, right? Like you, yeah. you, you give them a little bit more time and some ease of living and they'll... Uh, we're we're going to... that. That's the show we will create. Snail Boy and the Octopuses. Octopuses. Because so, Octopi doesn't It'll be a direct really sequel to Star Trek uh, uh, Insurrection. And, uh, In- insert what now? Insurrection. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, but it's it's cool. I like the ship. I like... I, I like um, uh, his name just left Rios. Me. I like Rios a lot. Like, that's a cool character. I like that so far, minus the doctor, not not the image, but the uh, professor, um, uh, scientist, um, we're seeing a lot of characters we haven't gotten to see in a Star Trek before. Yes. Um, in 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 real significant ways, we're getting we're seeing troubled characters. We're seeing uh, kind of broken toys of the perfect future, and I think that that is neat. Because you can't honestly believe that the future becomes that perfect. It, it, that's not a viable universe. It's an optimistic one 
it's certainly attainable, but human pain, conflict, and suffering is also what drives human creativity. So we'd be in a pretty bereft universe if not to have to struggle for things to some degree. So, therefore, to make great people in the future, great... Uh, oh, wouldn't that be an people. amazing payoff for the whole subplot is... You know, once the Romulans were effectu effectively neutered, I keep going back to that word, um, the, the the Federation had nobody. The Borg had been defeated. The Romulans are gone. The Klingons have, okay. have effectively assimilated. Yeah. What if the whole point of it was to create conflict to drive military and, uh, and Get technology that forward? that budget. Oh, my God, now I'm sad. It's... We don't even... That's my theory. So I kid you not... When he was looking up at the stars, in his little like bedroom area on his ship, my brain just went so fast. <laughs> uh, okay, that was that was an awesome scene on a bunch of levels. It was so good. Number uh, one, it told us he's got an emergency medical hologram and, and an emergency navigational hologram. And he chose to make them both look like him. Yeah, the one's English and one's Irish. Yep. Um, that's honestly that's creative. I I would not want to Rios look at. Rios is having a lot of fun. So I don't know. Time. I don't know that that's fun. I feel like there's a deep psychological oh, yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, the I actor really, playing Rios. Is oh, he's having, having a, lot of fun. a great time. Yeah. Uh, I really liked. It was super subtle. I don't know how many people caught it. Um, when the ENH says, "Are you a little starstruck?" Rios reaches for the hole in his shoulder where the shrapnel had been, mm -hmm. um, which in the first scene he very cavalierly said, no dermal regeneration, I'm just going to sit here with a hole in my shoulder because I'm tough. I think that was him trying to impress Picard. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's a sort of a sort of a moment. I We've all I, been there. Yeah. I'm so tough. I'm, that's how manly I am. It's a great, it's like, it makes Rios a very compelling character in a way that we haven't seen because he kind of he's a loner but then he has multiple clones of himself but not himself right. they're not like him at all they're very different personalities and so so like i like i really like the first two episodes bogged down with exposition they are now really tightly defining characters yep. via action and short pieces of dialogue and but I think working. it's super ex effective. I think j th what this episode series needed in the second episode that it didn't quite get there is it needed its cast expansion so that it could jump scene to scene and spend three to five minutes with yeah. the cast instead of seven to nine. Yep. So before we get into the fight that was awesome that we just watched, and it's so weird to say that there was enjoyable action on a Star Trek still. I, I am still like, stunned. Like either either normally it's cut to pieces to the point where it's kind of hard to follow, which yes. happens a lot on Discovery, um, or uh, it's just garbage because Star Trek is garbage. Always action. been garbage. Um, that's why I had to have the big score moments. Yes. It's the it's the show that gave us the Batleth, yeah. the single least combat capable you mean, weapon. You mean greatest weapon of all? Time. I mean greatest weapon yeah, of, of all. Time. You know, someone was using it to murder people recently. <laughs> um, you don't get into Valhalla if you are killed <laughs> by a Batleth. Um, no, you do not. But you do get into Stovall Core. Um, uh, but what I like is that they're unpacking the Romulan storyline, the Reclamation Cube storyline, nice and slowly in smaller pieces. And I think that makes sense because this is called Star Trek Picard. Right. So we, you, you know, it's a smart writing choice to have another location of an eventual interaction that's going to definitively happen as part of the main plot. And so that we can grow attached to that character before then. But what I like is that they're playing it slow so that or they're playing it slow but they're also playing it short so it doesn't feel like it's a constant like ah oh, now five seven minutes away from the reason i'm watching the show yes. 
And so I like that they played to their strengths well in the writing on this. And it actually makes me casually to noticeably interested in that because they're not giving too much of it to me yet. Um, I'm more interested in the mysteries coming from the Jean-Luc side. But this now has little, like, fun stackables that they don't have to answer any times. Yeah. Unlike what they're doing with Picard, where they're putting up questions and answering them in the next episode, other than the largest arc. So I, I, and they're, they're, they're d- doing more of the, like, we're just going to stack mystery on mystery what's happening here. Yeah, for me, that fight was, was very fun. But... Yeah. but the um the reason i it, the reason i was excited by it is everything it tells us um we know that it, little things like we know that picard had an alarm a, a, some kind of a, a of a grounds alarm that the romulans defeated he keeps a pistol at his desk yep. and another pistol underneath a table mm. like three paces away yep. the two romulans which we we guessed they had I mean, especially after all of the, the exposition last episode, we knew that they had some kind of special forces background, mm-hmm. uh, but now we've seen them in action um, and they were really efficient. You know, she doesn't go for the gun first because it's slow. She goes for a knife, gets behind a window. Like there's there's a lot of really smart storytelling going on. And as a storyteller, that excites me a lot. Yeah, it's 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 good. And uh, also Jean-Luc took some hits. Oh, poor how he's in his 90s oh, he's not but how then how brutal but then, is that moment where the, he goes with the, the the cane and just gets beaten yeah, beaten back but then he gets a hold of the equalizer a yeah. gun and yeah. he shoots them because he can still do that just as well um There's, and, there there needed to be like a slow-mo close-up of, of a little tear forming as he's getting thrown across the room like god damn it i used to be good at this stuff all right or at least good in a Star Trek way. Right. Chopped. <laughs> um. Enter. Are you alright? I would like to contrast that with episode two's crosscut scenes because mm. episode two has those two like expositiony talk scenes and they feel long and they feel slow. They don't feel like they're moving the thing, even though they're cut well together. This, on the other hand, I think moved, did a good job at being like, okay, we're going to un, we're going to unpeel some Romulan here. Yes. On two different sides, two yes. completely different subject matters, but connected to the same thing. And uh, also, uh, kudos to them, because every time something simple like this answers a question, I am very satisfied, which is, yeah, why what do if, what if some Romulans have a little, little bumpy head and other Romulans don't have a little bumpy head? No, oh, there's northern and southern Romulans. Yeah, that Whatever would... the hell that means. It just means that some of them have bumpy head as a yeah. thing. It's like a cleft well, they chin. Have, they have to be from different places. Like, where's North and the Romulan Star Empire? Oh, so no, I, 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 I'm thinking, honestly, it's just people who inherited the ethnic genes of oh. Northern Romulus, where maybe there was either, maybe that was like a recessive trait, like it came up every yeah. now and again, like a, like a cleft chin. Um, and... It became popular in the North, so then that group Could bred be. it more, and now that's just a thing. Yeah. Sort of like how Vikings just sort of raped red, red, red hair into every Northern European and some Northern American colonies. True. <laughs> desperately trying to make it a thing. Um, but yeah, I think it cut back and forth pretty well. I think it got there. Again, a ton of... A ton of information without needing a ton of exposition. Yeah, yeah. We We're watching that, an interrogation, which yeah. by nature is question and answer. But we have, so since I brought it up earlier, let's contrast where Rafi swears she has proof of the um, corruption inside of Starfleet. Here we have two separate sources delivering identical information. That's a form of confirmation that yeah, at least we now know what the Romulans believe. Um we got a, there was a beautiful little throwaway scene in there of of um, Javon organizing all of the 
uh, commandeered weapons. He lines up all the rifles, lines up all the pistols. Super subtle. No reason to put that in there. Except Beautiful it, detail work. So Makes it more real. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, overall, it just feels good. It felt like a good moment where it's like, okay, we're unpacking this mystery. Yeah, he's going to kill the... This is indeed the end of the beginning. Yeah, Javon's going to kill the prisoner with one stroke of a some kind of a knife hand chop. Yeah. Which is as Classic Trek stuff. as it gets. Knife hand chops do whatever you need them to do. Star Always. Trek. I love times. them so much. I, uh, I, I want to... I, I don't know that this is the best time for it, but the the layers of oh yeah this um this scientist is clearly not a scientist that we're getting where we um all the time she shows up she like she shows up and has the disruptor in her hand did that dude just set his rifle down outside because he decided he didn't are need you it? are you becoming suspicious of our scientists? but i i loved the the i thought that you know there's no stun setting was cute and a nice little callback but the um the fact that she doesn't bother to turn all the way around during the interrogation told me a ton. She is sitting with her back casually to a guy who just tried to kill all of them while they're inter inter interrogating him, and she is doing her best to look casual. Layers of storytelling. I love it. They're, they're on a great pathway. Here he is. I can smell her on you. Remarkably carnal. It is an extraordinary piece of machine. What she told you. So that family tree is interesting, and you bring up the theory that you know she might be the brother. Yes. That that she just changes to whatever they just change to whatever meets their needs. Yes. And I'm kind of behind that, and it also makes that scene gently less upsetting for me. I I have Weirdly to say. Enough, I, it, that it gets more interesting when you think that it applies to both of them. Yeah, right. So if maybe if they the both only, do that. Yeah, if the only qualification those two super spies have is that we know that she was born a he, and the now he clings to that. That's an interesting yeah, it's personal a, again, dynamic. I have no it's idea. It's one of those things where they're like, out there we can pursue this or not. We don't yeah. have to jump on it. Engage. We end it with the classic engage, right? Like, it's disgusting how hard for Picard engage made me. Uh, it's so simple, but it's so necessary. Like oh, yeah. it would Love be, it. it would be disingenuous of them not to have him. It's not like he's like, I'll never captain a ship again or something like that. He left pretty much under protest. Oh, yeah, it's so, just a beautiful payoff moment. Yeah, it was a good payoff moment. Made me feel good. Uh, you got the crew together. You're right, though. Like, straight up, Raffi's like, we're not even background check this this Agnes chicken. Um, so, and, and, and so... There, so yeah. that just tells me that Picard knows she's a spy. Yeah, Picard's playing the long game this yeah, whole time. He he, he Plus didn't he might, miss a bit. I believe she's actually, you know, like 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 doctor, uh, professor of. Well, she has to be of AI, right? And so he's got to be like, I need this person. Like, right. I need. I'll, I'll turn her. Yeah, I've turned so she, harder. We have we have a Romulan who's been in Starfleet for at least thirty or forty years. We've got now a scientist who is the world's foremost or, or near the federation's foremost yeah. uh expert on cybernetics she's that's a shit ton of schooling um these are these are characters who are what they appear to be in addition to being spies so yeah it would be a it would be foolish not to use her for what you can mm -hmm. and b at least now he knows where one spy is yeah right um a hundred percent uh, I yeah, I don't I don't see how there's anything other than than a betrayal there that he then turns to a success kind correct, of thing. Correct. Um, good episode. Good episode. Oh, yeah, Real strong tight. third episode. Loved um, it. Uh, I do not think that we're going to be disappointed in this series. At this point, I think with three episodes in. Unless they do some real wonky writing choices to get to places, or they try to cover too much ground in ten episodes, yeah, um, 
I and I feel like this series is on the right track to be somebody um on one of the groups was commenting on Picard positively and they said that that made them relook at Discovery because the reasons they liked Discovery were how different it was and Picard is very different than next gen completely but yeah. Picard himself isn't different no he's just in a different scenario no and that matters um i think a lot so uh and also just Picard isn't as heavy on the action it's not as punchy as discovery so it gives you those pieces to kind of like like and breadcrumbs them in but it stays in a lot of conversation back and forth discovery of information through dialogue and i think that's a little bit easier so i'm a fan of discovery um you were not a fan of discovery of what you watched and you gave me reasons that were like wholly built in filmic language and storytelling language it wasn't oh i don't like it because it's different or oh i don't like it because it's it's around my characters It, it yours were more structured in decisions made in how fast and how big to tell the story you do, it's it's less important that the Klingons changed and more about what those changed Klingons do. Right. Um, and I and so but for those that just were turned off initially because it was a much grittier, grimmer, darker Star Trek, maybe watch Picard and if you like Picard, maybe go back and give Discovery a try. Maybe it won't be such a such a a, 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 a dunk into cold water as it is so very different it's so much more like the kelvin jj verse but also grim that i understand like i don't wholly like disagree with people they're like that just doesn't feel like the star trek i grew up with because it had never been grim it had had dark plot lines but grim wasn't a word ever used i i think there is a lot of parallel there to where we're at with picard um, the it's almost now having seen episode three, I would almost tell somebody if they were wanting if they were like I don't know if I'm into it start with episode three, a lot of it won't make sense, but it's punchy and it's tight yeah and then go back because a, you know some of the critiques I, I we talked about them at the time episode one Picard is old and he's broken and we don't know what the hell's going on and any time you have a pilot episode shows take time to get their feet underneath yeah. Them. It's just a thing. And a good show just takes the time because they're aware they're going to pay it off. Yeah. And they do in these first three episodes. I'm the other way where I would tell people to watch the first episode, but you have to watch the second and the third. Watch it like a film. Sure. These are 40 minutes after commercials and credits get trimmed out. That means it is exactly a two-hour film. If you watch it like the first part of a movie, which it clearly is supposed to be act one. Um uh like the first part of a trilogy basically you're getting you're getting what they kind of actually wanted the beginning of the show to be yeah which is pretty good because honestly most star treks have taken an entire season to get a oh at least episode. yeah oh yeah uh, no, the, the... i still stand ds9 gets to watchable episodes pretty quickly um not the whole of the first season but lots of individual episodes are watchable but that's just because of the nature of the kind of show they were building where they're just like, well, we have characters, and each episode's going to focus on a character like Next Gen. Right. But our characters are a bit broader and a bit different. And uh, we also happen to have snagged a young, 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 Cole Meany. Um, wow. <laughs> before, people, before people understood, it's like, oh, Cole Meany's a really good actor, though. That's true. Um, uh, and uh, we just had a good cast uh, for it. But, uh, um, uh, but most Star Trek, yeah, most I, Star I Trek think, takes a season. I think with Picard, if two hadn't been such a slog, mm-hmm. uh, just just such an oh, exposition yeah. dump. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you if you kind of like you said, I like the idea for somebody to sit down and watch the whole thing. Watch it, just uh, watch it like a movie. And just present it to him as like it's two hour pilot. Yeah, the two hour pilot. Yeah, but if you don't like it by the end of that pilot, if you're not interested in continuing it, then you're probably not going to like it. Yeah, if you're not if you're not into Picard now at the end of episode three, I kind of I, I mean there's nothing to tell you. Yeah, I, I can't imagine the show is going to produce 
any moments more interesting or dynamic than what they've already done. Yeah. They the might have sense. some more surprising turns. Well, sure. Other you're going to have lots of that. But uh, if you're not into it, if I, you're I don't not think they're going to uh, Follow Dying Exposure's highly illogical series about Star Trek the Animated Series uh, and an episode to episode watch. Next episode comes out tomorrow. Um, uh, and then. Uh, uh, also follow, um, and that's another bi- that's a bi-weekly series. And just follow us for other nerd content about Lots of comic book, content. movies, uh, nerd music. Um, uh, what did we talk about? We talked about Castlevania in the next episode of uh, You About to Learn with Shubzilla. Uh, we talked about cats in the last episode. So like and subscribe on YouTube uh, for any of the podcast listeners, whatever your preferred form of podcast where Siebel is, you can sign up for notifications there. You can also go to dyingofexposure.com. That's the main website. Everything gets posted there. Uh, and uh, follow us on social media at dyingofexposure.com. But I'm excited for episode four. Yeah, come back next time for more Hard for Dark. Yeah. You mean rant and watch. Sure. Engages. Sure, that's Wait. that's absolutely what that's I mean. What the YouTube Why is. wouldn't you call it rant and watch when instead of Hard for Picard? I mean, you... you Clearly, you're not one wrong. of those is you're better. Not, you're not than wrong. The other. You're not wrong that yours is a catchier title. Mine is a YouTube title that like might come up in a search result. <laughs> um, which I don't is, know. You know what? If if by some miracle, I cannot imagine if we somehow cornered the hard for Picard Google market. I'm okay with You're that. You're okay with I being have the... to imagine that slash fiction how, is already out how there. How disappointed but... would you be, though, if you're looking for Picard-based tumescence yeah. and you get us <laughs> in this show? Honestly, if you haven't created it by this point, I I, I think it's on you. We, yeah. we own it now. It's too bad. Uh, anyway, uh, I've been Steve. <laughs> I'm Greg. Thanks for joining Dying Exposure and Engage.